It's The Real News. I'm Aaron Mate. President Trump is denying a report he has sought a massive expansion of U.S. nuclear weapons. NBC News reported Tuesday that this summer, Trump asked top officials for a nearly tenfold increase of the U.S. nuclear arsenal. Trump was shown a chart of the U.S. stockpile over 70 years, and he's said to have pointed to the part of the chart showing the arsenal's highest point, about 32,000 warheads in the late 1960s. Trump apparently, quote, told his team he wanted the U.S. to have that many now, officials said, according to NBC. On Twitter today, Trump called the NBC report pure fiction. But Trump is no stranger to making alarming statements about nuclear weapons. On top of his threats to North Korea, Trump has openly called for expanding the nuclear arsenal. But one thing that has been overlooked is that Trump is not the only one. Under President Obama, the U.S. undertook a major enhancement of its nuclear weapons program. In a recent study from the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists called Obama's program, a revolutionary increase in the lethality of submarine-borne U.S. nuclear forces that boosts the overall killing power of existing U.S. ballistic missile forces by a factor of roughly three. Hans Christensen is the lead co-author of that study. He is the director of the Nuclear Information Project at the Federation of American Scientists. Hans, welcome. Let's start with your reaction to this report of President Trump asking his top officials for a tenfold increase of the U.S. nuclear arsenal. Well, um, it shows that the current president operates on another plane, if you will, um, in terms of facts. Um, it, you know, obviously he can he can he can say what he wants, but. Even if he wanted to, there was no way that the United States could build up its nuclear weapons to that level or wanted to uh, today. So it's, it's an odd report, but it's consistent with the strange uh, statements that uh, he has been making over the years uh, or the last many months here he's been in office, but even before that. So um, it, you know, it remains to be seen, but my, my concern is not so much that he will try to increase the size of the arsenal, it's more that he is, um, he seems sort of prepositioned for greatness in terms of uh, nuclear weapons and likes to see more, um, but that could also translate into uh, better capabilities, so to speak, or a few more types or something like that. So it remains to be seen what happens because we now, we're waiting for the results of the Trump administration's so-called nuclear posture review which is a, a study, an internal study of what the U.S. arsenal should look like for the next 10 years. Hmm. So on that point about uh, enhancing the capability of the weapons, um, this is part of the reason why I wanted to have you on, is because you co-authored that study that I mentioned, showing, uh, just quoting it again, a revolutionary increase in the lethality of submarine-borne U.S. nuclear forces. So. This even predates President Trump. This happened under President Obama. Can you talk about what you looked at in your study? Yeah, it even uh, predates um, uh, the Obama administration. It was something that started all the way back in the, in the Clinton years and then took, took off in the, in the Bush years. And uh, the program really, really kicked in during the Obama years. And it's going to finish here um, in two years, I think it is, one or two years. Um, so this is a very big pro uh, program. Um, <clears throat> basically, what we looked at um, were reports about um, indicators we've gotten here and there over the years that uh, something was going on with the warhead that the U.S. is currently producing or reproducing. Uh, it's one of the two warheads that's on the Navy's ballistic missile submarines. Um, it has a maximum yield of 100 kiloton. And so it has not been particularly useful against uh, hardened underground targets. And so some of the things we heard was that um, they had fiddled with the, the fusing component on the, uh, the re-entry body, not changing the warhead nuclear explosive package itself, not the, the, the piece that goes bang. It's not like the increasing the yield or something. But they've changed the way the warhead navigates, so to speak, uh, not by increasing its accuracy, 
but by being able to detonate at an exact uh, more appropriate height over the, uh, the target than previously. Um, so by doing that, they have relatively cheap, uh, cheaply been able to increase the capacity of that portion uh, of, this, uh, of the arsenal to hold at risk uh, hardened underground facilities such as um, uh, ICBM silos and command centers. And you say in your study that uh, that process has thus increased the overall killing power of U.S. Uh, US ballistic missiles by roughly a factor of three? That's correct. Um, the, um, the kill probability of using this warhead against a hardened target, for example, a silo, has gone up about a factor of three. And the point is that you, you don't have to expend as many warheads per target as you would have uh, previously to, in order to be certain that the, the target had been destroyed. Um, so the advantage of that, of course, is that as you go to lower numbers in, in the nuclear weapons stockpile in total, those that are left uh, can be used uh, more efficiently. Um, so in a way, it is um, to compensate uh, for that. You can no longer afford to have a lot of nuclear weapons uh, you know, sort of earmarked for a certain group of targets. And so what they like to see are that the accuracy and the efficiency of nuclear weapons in general in the future uh, modernized nuclear weapon stockpile, uh, that increases so you can do with fewer weapons and those you have are much more efficient. Right. Okay. So just to underline this, you know, while President Trump is brazenly calling for increasing, expanding the U.S. nuclear arsenal, that in some ways might uh, obscure the fact that previous uh, presidents have done something similar, but just with um, in a more understated way. So even if they can say that they've reduced the amount of warheads, they've quietly expanded the killing capacity of those warheads, so in some ways offsetting the reduction of the number. Uh, to some extent, but the, 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 no, the number reduction, of course, is an achievement in and of itself, because that relates to, if you could call it the overall arms control process, for example, uh, with Russia, um, where the two countries are trying to reduce their arsenals, how many nuclear warheads they have. And that is what tr Trump has been talking about uh, in the context of this latest news story. Um, it's sort of the simple way of looking at it, counting warhead numbers. What the military is more interested in now and, and has been for many years and increasingly so is to make the weapons that are left more efficient uh, and more flexible so they could be used against the wider range of targets and also produce less radioactive fallout by making advantage, taking advantage of uh, their capabilities. So it's, um, it's an ongoing process. It's been underway for a long time, and it's uh, slated to continue. We will see uh, the Air Force is underway with an upgrade of uh, one of its warheads on its uh, uh, Minuteman III ICBM that will also get this capability. So I predict that in the future, once they're done with all these upgrades, we would probably have a hard target kill capability on all the ballistic warheads on uh, on all, uh, both the sea-based and the land-based layer. So the question becomes then, which you do explore in your study, what are the implications here for global security? How does this enhancement of the U.S. arsenal factor into Russia's thinking, Russia who has yeah. the, the other major nuclear stockpile? Well, Russia, of course, is making its own dirty work, <laughs> its own modernization of its uh, um, its nuclear arsenal. And we've just seen recently here some examples of Russia uh, testing new types of warheads and, or new types of re-entry vehicles to go on their ballistic missiles. Um, so they're operating their systems as well, uh, but they're doing it uh, for their reasons. Um, and you could say in a way that's part of what's going on here, that both countries are modernizing their forces based on what they want to see, be, they want to be able to do with their military forces. And that is not just a question of nuclear. It's a broader issue of strategic capabilities. And so this nuclear upgrade fits into a broader enhancement of U.S. offensive capabilities. Um, so for an adversary that was paranoid 
and convinced that the United States is out to uh, conduct a surprise first attack and decapitate their nuclear forces or something to that effect. Um, these would be some of the signs they would be looking for. Um, and that would reaffirm probably in their mind that, uh, that the U.S. has intentions like that. Um, I don't think the U.S., uh, certainly not at the nuclear level, is, is interesting at all in conducting sort of broad uh, first decapitating strikes uh, at all. I think uh, it's a totally different form of planning today. But it appears to that, uh, to an adversary that is already convinced that the United States is using advanced nuclear forces plus advanced conventional forces plus ballistic missile defense plus cyber attack capabilities to get the upper hand um, in a uh, major uh, war. So these things have a nasty way of uh, sort of reaffirming what countries perhaps already fear. Right, and, and part of the big problem with nuclear weapons is that if a mistake is made, if there's a miscalculation, if there's a misreading what the other side is doing, that also raises the threat uh, of some sort of mistaken uh, decision that threatens annihilation, right? And, and this, this modernization would seem to increase that risk. Well, it, one of the things that uh, all countries are very um, fearful about um, is sort of um, what I call this uh, surprise first attack that could, if not entirely decapitate, but certainly put out of business a significant portion of their uh, retaliatory capability. And so for the Russians, it would be particularly concerning that these are capabilities that increase the, uh, the capability of the, the, the warheads to kill uh, their quick launch uh, ICBMs. Uh, and the U.S. already has more than enough capability um, to hold at risk all the Russian uh, ICBM silos. Um, and that can push, of course, a development where the strategic relationship between the United States and Russia is kept on an artificially high readiness level because both sides will have to fear that the other side is out to get them in a surprise attack. So if you want to increase international stability, you want to move away from forces that have the capabilities to conduct these kind of um, decapitating or disabling strikes, uh, if you will. And the land-based ICBMs have traditionally had that role. Um, now, with this capability, um, and also because of another warhead that has been on the submarines for a while, um, this is now a capability that, at least in the U.S. Uh, nuclear arsenal, is, is very, very potent at sea. And for an adversary, that provides that's an extra step, because uh, unlike the ICBMs on land, the submarines can move. And they can sail close to, relatively close to an adversary's territory, which means that you can launch missiles against their targets, hypothetically in a surprise attack, where these warheads will land on their target in about half the time it otherwise would take to get a warhead on target from an ICBM. As we wrap, uh, you mentioned before that the U.S. is undergoing a uh, review of its nuclear posture. Um, Seeing as to how the uh, nuclear arsenal, the capability has been enhanced, even if the number of warheads has been reduced, what do you see as the optimal solution to uh, deal with the, the, you know, the lethality, the danger of the nuclear arsenal of both U.S. and Russia, uh, especially at a time when tensions between the two sides are so high? Uh, there are several uh, steps that have to be taken. First of all, uh, on the arms control level, if you will, where the New START Treaty, like we talked about, um, will be implemented or enter into uh, effect uh, next year in February. The two countries are on track to meet that uh, treaty, but the treaty expires three years later in 2021. It can be extended for five years. So the least that the United States and Russia should do, of course, is to make an agreement to extend that treaty. Doing anything but that would be uh, uh, very uh, problematic for uh, international relations in general because of the support that's needed from countries around the world uh, to do you know, a lot of stuff on non-proliferation policies in, in general. Uh, too compli complicated to get into now, but I think that's 
that's a must. And the other thing they have to do is they have to fix the INF Treaty, where Russia apparently has violated it by deploying a ground launch uh, system with an INF range, um, intermediate range. Um, now what's happening is that the White House apparently is favoring the United States also uh, conducting research and development of such a missile, um, not necessarily testing it and deploying it, but certainly taking the step toward that. And so both sides need to get back in, 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 in sync with the, the INF treaty and stop doing these um, type of uh, either clear violations or steps to more toward a violation. Um, so that's sort of, sort of the arms control issue. So I suspect what they could do very quickly they could very quickly lay, uh, make an agreement where they re uh, agree to change the New START treaty to uh, reduce the deployed nuclear forces by another third. Um, the United States military has already, several years ago, concluded that even when the New START treaty enters into effect and is implemented, the United States will at that point have more than one third nuclear weapons, more than it actually needs for its military uh, strategy. Um, but they want to see Russia come along on that. So I think it's important to engage the Russians directly and try to move this forward. Um, on the force structure developments in general, I think what's really needed is that the two sides continue to modify uh, their, their requirements to reduce reliance on nuclear weapons in general. Uh, we have seen an uptick uh, recently in the role that nuclear weapons are said to play in their strategies. Uh, both Russia, of course, is doing that and that's concern, concerned in NATO, uh, but also the United States in response to that has also started to uh, tweak its nuclear operations. Um, so it's very important that the two sides uh, on those two levels uh, begin to uh, calm things down and, and, and trim these uh, operations and force structures, et cetera, et cetera, uh, and maybe use that as a way to break through some of this um, very negative atmosphere that there is between uh, East and West today. We'll leave it there. Hans Christensen, Director of the Nuclear Information Project at the Federation of American Scientists, thank you. Thanks for having me. And thank you for joining us on The Road News.